Uh, Coach, I guess everybody likes a, to have a quarterback that's had a lot of game time and everything. What value is there for a guy to get a couple of years in the system as an understudy, and how has Greg McElroy handled that role? Well, I think, I think that any player improves regardless of his role. And obviously you never really want to play a player before he's ready to play. And I think that to have patience to develop at any position is probably something that most players don't like to have, but in a lot of cases probably need. So that, and some realize that they need it and some don't. And I think in Greg McElroy's case, because he's such an intelligent, fine young man, that he realizes what he has to do to improve, and he has improved in our system dramatically in the two years that we've been here leading up to his opportunity. And I think these guys also, some of them have enough foresight, even though that's sometimes we have that conversation about guys not understanding consequences of their behavior. You know, you have freedom of choice, but you don't have freedom of consequence. I've said that one before that he has enough foresight to realize that even what he did two years ago last year, every time he got an opportunity, every time he's gotten an opportunity in the spring, that he was eventually going to be a guy that was going to go out there and play. And I don't think there's any substitute for experience, and I don't think there's any substitute for the fact that as he gets experience and makes plays, he's going to become more confident, and the players around him are going to become more confident in him. And I think with that, his leadership will be more effective, and he will be a very effective player. To piggyback off his question, Coach, uh, talk about his demeanor this week leading up to the game psychologically. Uh, how, does, how does he look? How does he uh, just being around him, McElroy? Oh, great. He's been very good. You know, I think he's a, he's a pretty common, systematic approach guy. I mean, he's not a... He, he, he realizes that preparation is important. He always wants to get it right, um, almost to a fault, because you can't control all the variables in a football game. Somebody's going to mess up. Left tackle is not going to block the guy right. Receiver's not going to run the exact route. And I, I think those types of things are what players playing together and gaining experience actually helps a guy be able to adjust and adapt to. But he has been very good. Um, we have every confidence in him as a quarterback. My concern would be more, are the players around him going to play well enough to allow him to do what he needs to do to be a good player? Because I've said this quite often, quarterback is a difficult position to play if you don't have the people around you playing well then because you always have the ball. You always have to make a decision. You always have to make a judgment. And their disciplined execution make those things a little clearer and make those choices and decisions a little easier to make more quickly, which all helps. Two questions, Coach. Um, first, can you comment on the preseason that Terry Grant had and, and what role you see him having this season? And secondly, uh, you mentioned number six for Virginia Tech, the defensive end. Can you just comment a little more on his skills and the matchup you face there? Well, uh, Terry Grant has done an outstanding job. He did a very good job last year. I think he handled an adverse circumstance last year on our team as a guy who was, had gotten hurt and in coming back from that injury sort of had some guys maybe pass him up that he probably didn't count on um, but made a tremendous contribution to our team on special teams. And when he got an opportunity, uh, did a very good job and took advantage of it for the most part. But instead of sort of going in the shell and accepting that circumstance, he has worked as hard as anybody on our team uh, and been as positive in his energy and attitude as anybody on our team through spring practice, off season, summer, and this fall camp to develop a role for himself on our team. And Certainly right now, I think he's listed as a backup at his position with Mark, but feel like those guys can both be starters. And, you know, he's got speed and a space player, and um, hopefully we can get him the ball in, in ways that he can make plays and 
uh, give us another weapon on offense. Um, their defensive end is really a good player. They, they, they have maybe not as, as big a guys up front as sometimes we play at linebacker and defensive end, but they're very quick and very aggressive. And this guy's a very good pass rusher and a, a, a very quick, tough, explosive, good first step quickness kind of a guy who uh, can make a difference in pass rush for sure uh, for them and uh, is a very good player. But that, that's sort of their defense. I mean, they will move and stunt and, you know, bring a guy off the edge and beat you with their quickness. And, uh, but they also can play you straight up, and they play their system very well, and they have a very good system. And um, they've played very good defense there historically and have a great tradition for it, and this group will be no different. Nick, what did Justin Woodall do to earn the starting position, and will he call the signals back there in the secondary? Well, I think that um, that's certainly a responsibility in the secondary that Justin's been a starter for us all last year and certainly did an outstanding job for us. And I think you get in a little bit of a comfort zone as a player when you have somebody like Rashad Johnson, who is very bright and a leader and uh, actually wants to – take the responsibility of making calls and understanding things and uh, because that's his personality type and he has those kind of leadership skills. And I think that one of the things that we've sort of tried to pass the torch to Justin because he has the most experience uh, at safety is for him to contribute to that. But I do think that it's very important that both safeties communicate that. And I think it's going to be important for you know, Mark to continue to grow in that area and to communicate. Communication is critical in the secondary. And because even if you communicate the wrong thing, if everybody does it wrong, it's right. Does that make sense? It sounds backwards. But if we're supposed to be playing cover two and everybody plays cover three, we're fine. And we can get mad on the sidelines and throw our headset because we missed a check and all that. But we're not going to give up a touchdown because we're still playing sound. Everybody's playing the same thing. It might not be what we wanted to play. All right, but what the problem in the secondary is is when you're supposed to be playing cover three and these guys on this side are playing cover three and these guys on this side are playing cover two, then somebody runs right down the middle of the field and there's nobody there. So that's the reason that communication is so important. And the safeties must communicate to the corners, and they must communicate to the perimeter outside backers what the support is as well as what coverage that we're playing. So I think both safeties' communication is critical, and Justin has to assume some of that role. Have you been given any indication from the NCAA about the Julio Jones-Mark Ingram case? Not to this point. Coach, um, just listening to you talk about the amount of multiples, you know, running out of colors and so forth and how much you have to teach uh, going into a game like this. And I'm just curious, and this is related somewhat to the situation at Michigan, how, how you managed to fit that in the NCAA allotted time and is there ever a point where you just can't get done in that many hours a week what you need to get done? No, we, we, we sort of, we, we, we always seem to be able to manage it just fine. Uh, I think that that players do have to do some things on their own. Um, you know, we cover, we try to define for our players what they need to do on their own. In other words, we have a signal caller's assignment each week for 13 different things on defense, whether it's quarterback at the line, uh, certain receivers, certain formations, um, motion adjustments and so we, we make a video we, we assign that to a guy and he has to report like homework well we, we don't have time we, we can't in 20 hours like in pro ball you sit and watch all those things with the players you, you, you don't need to make signal callers assignments you can point out these are the motions, here are the things, these are adjustments we need to make because you're with them for eight hours a day. But we have to rely on our players investing a little bit of time on their own off the field 
because our time is installation, game plan, time on the practice field, and that's it. That's all we can do in a 20-hour week. And in the offseason, you have eight hours, but, you know, we don't do a lot of football stuff in, 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 in the offseason. You know, we work on our conditioning and our strength, and we do it in spring practice. And in our summer conditioning program, we have the players completely on their own, you know, doing whether it's seven on seven that they, you know, we tell the middle linebacker, you call the defenses, you know, quarterbacks, you call the plays, and they should know that. And they need to do that. They need to work together, the quarterbacks and the receivers, and they need to do those things. But the issue is, is the coaches can't be out there coaching them. And we just can't do that. They can't accuse me of that because I'm not even around. I'm trying to get coached on how to hit a golf ball straight. With the players? Uh, you know, we practice one less day because the players had to have a day off. So typically on Monday, they would come in and watch the film, get treatment, and probably by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and they would probably, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and they probably came in at 10 o'clock, they were done. And then they got Tuesday off, so they weren't there all day on Tuesday. But on Wednesday, the players came in at 7.20, and they didn't leave until 4.30 or 5 o'clock. And they did that on Wednesday, Thursday. Friday wasn't quite that long. And Saturday, we had some meetings. So how many hours is that? Three eight-hour days, probably. Maybe a couple five. Maybe 30. Not counting the game. But I, I really feel like, and I want to say this, that um, we, we have time enough to do what we need to do. And in fairness to the players, and they're here to get an education. They should have the opportunity to be student athletes. And, and I feel like the time that we have is, is adequate. All coaches would like to have a little more. But I, I, if I had a choice, I would say I would like a little more meeting time not really any more on the field time. Coach, are there any updates on the guys who are out Saturday with the uh, sickness? You know, guys, I think you just have to go out there every day. You know, we have a couple other guys sick today. I didn't bring the sheet in here. So I think a couple of the guys that were sick are better now. A couple guys that weren't sick are sick, so they're probably going to miss a day or two. But um, I just I can't think of because we have some guys that have. Our protocol is is we have some guys that are sick, but they don't have a fever, and we are treating them like they have the flu, even though we give them flu test and they really don't. But as long as they don't have a fever, we still let them come here because we feel like they're not contagious. All right, this is the medical doctors deciding this, not me. The guys that do have a fever, we're taken out of here and they're not here, so they can't practice and they can't be around here to try to manage the spread. So, but I, I, there'll be somebody between now and when we practice today that they'll come up and tell me he has a fever now, he can't practice today. And I say, fine. So, you know, I wish we didn't have to deal with this issue, but it is what it is, and um, we'll do the best we can, and I hope it doesn't have an, any effect for anybody in college football on any games. You guys gave up 62 points the last two games of the season against pretty good teams, and you're ranked number five in the country and based on your defense from what you read. How do you feel about that? Well, I feel bad about it. I've said it before that, you know, I think we're 0-2. And, you know, we've given up 31 points a game. You could say it either way. We gave up 62 points in two games or we gave up 31 points a game, right? So that doesn't sound like good defense to me. That doesn't sound like the identity that, you know, we want to have. 
I'm not being critical of our players. We're all responsible for that. You know, we played pretty well against Florida for three quarters in the game and gave up 14 points in the last nine minutes of the game or something like that. Um, and those things we work on to try to improve and fix. Um, we didn't play with any sense of urgency or intensity in the Utah game on either side of the ball and consequently gave up points early and gave up big plays and made mental errors. And, you know, that's this team has a chance to create its own identity. And if they have those things that I talked about, probably capable of being pretty good. And if they don't, we probably won't be very good.